enjoy. Uh, it's been good having you. And uh, this, what a way to end, because tonight we're going to be talking about the, the sixth and the ninth commandment. The church is teaching on human sexuality, which is always fun and um, interesting. So let's, let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we draw ever closer to Easter and the celebration of our redemption and our salvation, we do ask your blessings upon all of us here today in your house, especially those who are contemplating uh, the step of uh, full communion at the church or uh, baptism. So let's just please bless us in these remaining days before that great celebration. And bless us tonight as we discuss and talk about the great gift of human sexuality that you've given us. And so bless me as, as I speak and bless those who listen. And I ask this all through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I thought it is a, it's a starting scripture quote. I, I actually just have two, two scripture passages. Probably not super surprising, but just setting the, the scene from Genesis. If we talk about human sexuality and, and, and sort of the picture, the big picture of what, what the, God's hope for is here, I thought I'd read Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and Genesis 2, 22 to 25. And there's a reason that both, the, both these passages deal with one particular aspect of the, uh, the purpose of marriage and, and human sexuality. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. And then Genesis 2, that, that's a, a sense of the, the procreation power of, of the man and woman coming together. Then there's also this, the unity that's, that's part of this, uh, this great uh, gift of God. The Lord God then built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. And when he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and yet they felt no shame. And so there you have just a sense of that, that union that's supposed to be part of the, uh, the marriage relationship and the, the fact that this is, you know, this, this clinging to one another makes uh, two one, and not just in this sort of physical way, but also in spiritual way, and it, a, a new reality comes in there. So we, what I'd like to do today, again, is, is talk about these commandments and what the church means by and teaches in terms of human sexuality. I've already talked about marriage, and, but these are, for, for us, just intimately connected, uh, literally intimately connected topics. You know, I, and I, 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 this is a, an area where lots of people, I, I would say if there's any place in the, the church's teaching that is widely rejected and most controversial, it's probably this in the world today, certainly in the Western world, in the Northern, uh, Northern Hemisphere and Western world. I, I always preface this, and hopefully not too much in a sense of a sort of self-defensiveness, but everything I say about the church's teaching here tonight was, was, was uh, held by all Christians of any denomination or church up until about 1930. And so, and then the, the, Ang the Anglican communion uh, agreed to, in, in limited cases, married couples could use contraception. Up until then, it, it's contraception had been against the church's teaching, of, again, all Christians, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, whatever. It, it, it had been universal. The Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians had exactly the same teaching we did. Um, in terms of that. So, so in some ways, um, I think that's, that's good for people to, rem to remember that it's not like this is a Catholic thing we invented or we, we but it's, it's just, it was, it was a commonality that was part of the whole Christian tradition um, uh, for the first 19 centuries of, of the church's history. Again, whether you were Protestant or Catholic or whatever. And yet, in the face of, you know, technological changes and, and historical changes and social and cultural changes, uh, most, lots of what I'll say today will be, would not be held by um, other Christians uh, in our own country or th sometimes throughout the world. So I, I want to, 
we sometimes get this sense, I think, from the, the culture, the media, or perhaps other Catholics that with the church, and maybe because of the, it's poorly taught and it's not explained, that the church basically just teaches a series of no's about sexuality. No, you're not supposed to do that, 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 or that, okay? Uh, those are the rules and don't do any of them. And so there can be a very negative presentation of this, or at least a, a, a negative reception of what the church teaches about uh, the, the gift of human sexuality that, that he, uh, the Lord established at the very beginning of time and of human history that we touched upon simply with those two little readings from Genesis 1 and 2. I want to start, though, with the big picture. Again, I always like to talk about the big picture and, and what the, the whole idea of. Remember, what the, the whole purpose of, of human life is to join ourselves or to be joined by God into the sharing of the divine life. That we are to share in this, 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 the life of the Trinity itself. I preached about human sexuality back in February, uh, mid-February. So some of you went, were, at that, were at that one of those masses. So what I'm about to say is going to be a, a, a review for, for you. I'm going to simplify it. I'm not going to go through the whole homily. But for some of you, weren't there. And, and so I want to talk about the meaning that human sexuality has a meaning. It has a purpose. It has a goal. And these are objectively real. These are not something that I've come up with or you've come up with. Because I think that is a lot of what the culture today would say is, well, we, we create our own meaning for this, the gift of this human sexuality that I want to express and act out on. And if the church says, no, there, there, there's an overarching, objectively real purpose and meaning for sex, the sexual acts, and the sexual powers that we've been given. So that's why I want to go through the, first, the, the, the beginning of, of the talk today, and then I'm going to talk about, you know, go more in, into details about uh, other parts of it. So, it, again, this is also coming from that homily. It, it's from February 16, 2014, if you ever want to look it up or, or hear me give that on the, uh, the website. So, there's a broader meaning and purpose to sex. What is that? I think that for some people, as I said in the homily, the sexual acts are simply a physical means of giving and receiving pleasure. And I'm not saying that in a sort of pejorative, <laughs> you know, what a stupid idea that is. I'm simply saying that for many people in our culture today, there's not an objective meaning to sexual acts. It is, but the, the fact, the, the lived experience is one of, we, you hope, pleasure. And then that is the, the meaning. But, but it doesn't have in and of itself any extrinsic meaning beyond that. And I, the term I used there in the, the homily was, it's like a super massage. You know, you can give somebody a massage and it feels good and it can be a gift that people like. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it, it, sex is just that, but more. So it's a matter of difference of degree, not in kind. It's simply a pleasurable act. And it's connected with love. Of course, obviously, sex doesn't have to be connected with love. It's a physical action that could be uh, between any two persons or whatever. But people would like to connect it with love somehow. They've been told uh, that it's, it's supposed to be connected with love somehow. Although that historically hasn't always been the case. Uh, but in our culture, that's what it is. And so at the most, these the sexual acts are, are seen, it's, the gift is, it's connected with love because I'm going to give this gift of pleasure to somebody I love because giving gift of pleasures, I can do that all sorts of ways. Um, I, you know, there's all sorts of ways we give gifts for, for the people that uh, he is, or she likes, like, likes that. I'm going to do this for this person. And that's objectively the sense of, okay, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you something that feels good. And that's a present. But there are also some people who think, well, there, there has to be something deeper than that. Um, is, is it simply, simply a matter of exchanging pleasure with one another? Uh, because in that case, again, sex does not have any more in, in, intrinsically different quality to it. And so we're torn. There's some, there are many people who say, and that's good because there isn't. You're trying to mythologize and you're trying to uh, sacralize the sexual stuff, but it's not. You, 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 get, you get it all wrong for some people. But other people say, no, there, there's this deep sense that, no, it's something more than this. Uh, they have a, tr a, a very difficult time trying to put their finger upon what that more is. What, what is this sexuality? Um, why is it so important? Because in some sense, you know, it's a physical act. What, how different is it than shaking hands? I mean, how much different is it in kissing or, or, or shaking? You know, it, what, what's the big deal? What's, it's it's the connection and contact between bodies. But there's also the sense of, no, there's something more. So what I would say is, um, I want to talk about 
today, explain the basic why the church is teaching about sex that addresses this question. And why the Catholic Church teaches not simply a list of no's. This is the big yes. This is, this is, this is the, the big gift of, of why we think sex, sexuality is so important. Now, you know, I have, um, I know that there are many people here who say, you know, this idea of the Catholic Church's teaching that sex is only to be between a married man and a woman and open to life at some kind, so at, least not, at least not deliberately uh, thwarting life. Thinking, oh, you know, that, that seems like it's just uh, this, this whole bunch of no's, and where did they come, where did that even come from? And why would even, it's certainly challenging. But what I want to say is, let's talk about love. Let's connect sex and love. Because I think our world has a really hard time doing this now. Um, without our, this theology, I think there are lots of people who assume this without even knowing why, they have no really understanding of why this would be, these would, would or should be connected. They, they've been taught in some ways they think they should be, um, but they don't know how. So this is the, the Catholic uh, Church's theology of, of this. And again, I've, I've gone through this in that, that homily um, six weeks ago. But the first thing is, what is love? First of all, remember, God is love. So you ought to be thinking in the back of your mind, at the end of this, are we going to get to God as sex? Do you have any know, mathematics, you know, A equals B, B equals C, C equals A? Um, well, hold on to that thought. You know, the theology, this is called the theology of the body. Theology of the body is John Paul II's great teaching on human sexuality. It's a modern explanation of why the church teaches those, you know, what it, te what it teaches. And in the end, the whole idea, we're going to come back to the Trinity. Remember, God is love. Uh, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. And so that means the Trinity is the dynamic of love. And I am going to, the church says, here's what love is. Here's how it works. First thing is, it's a self, the self-gift of a person. You're, so we're dealing with persons here. Now, so anytime we love, we give ourselves to the one we love. There's somehow there's a self-gift, there's a self-donation, there's a pouring out. And you know that, if, you know that this person doesn't love me if this person isn't willing to share of himself or herself. And that can take all sorts of means. So when I'm talking about love, we're not just talking about sexual. Uh, but, but this is, you know, anytime you have persons who love, there's, these, these things will be true. And so this very idea of the self-gift, and you know, you want, you want the other person to trust you, to give of himself or herself. Um, there's self-sacrifice involved. Again, the cross is always the element of love, the symbol of love and throughout the universe is God giving himself for us uh, in the self-gift of the cross. And so there's always a, a self-gift. And, and when a person will not give of himself or herself to you, you think, does this person love me? I don't think the words are there, but I'm not seeing the self-gift. And we may not use that language, but we know what it is. Hmm, this guy says, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, and yet, um, I don't think he's given me anything. Self-gift leads to communion. Now, what communion means is a union of persons. Communion, uh, and this is the thing of the, the church, what is, it's, it's a communion-making body. Um, the whole idea of when we give ourselves to the other person, a bond is formed between the persons. If that, if that uh, self-gift is accepted in that way. And sometimes even if it's not, if even, I can love somebody who doesn't love me back. Now that's not ideal, et cetera, et cetera. But when I give myself, there's still, I can even have a communion, I can have a union with this person, that person may or may not recognize it, but it's especially powerful when I give myself to this person, this person gives himself or herself back to me, then a bond is formed, we call that love. That, that, the whole idea of, of the communion. When, and then when there's, when there's a union of persons, new life is formed. And again, I'm not talking here simply about biological life. Because this, this is true, this dynamic is true for all relationships of love between persons, whether that's parents and children, whether it's friends, whether it's husbands and you know, spouses, all sorts of ways in which human beings love one another. But whenever there's a communion of persons, something new in life-giving arises. And we can talk about that you know, our love dies, or our love is strong, or our love grows. 
Um, and yet, you, you become new people, new dimensions open up, new healing takes place. And you know, so in various different ways, when people give themselves to one another to form this bond of love, something new happens. And they're not the same as they used to be. I mean, you don't have to show hands here, but how many of you have experienced, I hope, love in such a way they felt, oh, wow, I'm, I'm a new person now. I said, I, I don't need any, I, I won't go to the stories right now, but you've, you've experienced that. And so if you haven't, that's a sad chapter of your life, saying, I've never loved this person in such a way that I felt, wow, new. I mean, how many of you have um, created, with the help of God, children, and you think, wow, here's a new life, and I'm not the same? You know, biologically I'm the same, but now there's this new life, this part of me, and I'm part of it, and I'm now a parent. Whoa, you know, this is a completely different new thing. So this is the dynamic. Self-gift leads to communion of persons. When persons give themselves to one another, there's a communion formed, and from that communion comes life. So that's, that is what love is. Now, so what's the connection between love and human sexuality then? So, so why we can say that sex and love are, are intimately connected is not simply there's a gift of pleasure that I'm giving this guy a super massage or something. Because, uh, frankly, that's pretty shallow. I mean, there's not a lot of depth there, I don't think, to the meaning. But if you're looking at this, you're thinking, so what, se- what the church says, sexual intercourse is simply, it's nonverbal language. When we're talking about the self-gift, um, we, we can say, I, I made it f- slightly fun of the idea of somebody saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, and never giving themselves or herself to the other person. But there's also the sense of the verbal language is important. Because sometimes we've had people who say, you know, I've loved this person all my life, and yet he never says, I love you. I want to hear the words. Come on. Well, does, I don't have to. I'm showing you by my actions. I know, I know, but I'd like to hear it. I've told you once, remember on the day I, I married you, I said, I love you. I haven't changed. Um, you know, that's the old thing. And you say, well, you know, I, I say it once a year. I mean, come on. <laughs> yes, you, you, there's language involved in this too. And in what sex is, sexual intercourse is meant to be the nonverbal language, a physical way of repeating and renewing the language of the marriage vows. So here we're going to connect sex, love, and marriage. Again, something that the, 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 uh, the culture around us would, would say, that's not, necessarily, that's not necessarily, this marriage thing can happen but cannot happen. But we'd say no, because if you understand what sex is, then you understand what it is, it is a non-physical, I mean, it's a physical, non-verbal way of renewing the language of your marriage vows. When you marry, you know, and of course, is, is the marriage vow acted out at its deepest level? It's freely choosing to make a total, faithful, and fruitful gift of oneself to one's spouse. And so in the marriage vows, you, you're, all, you're, you're promising and pledging to give yourself to this other person, again, self-gift. You're saying, you get everything. You get all, all the good and the bad, all the pain and suffering, all the happiness. Uh, you get my body, my mind, my soul, and, I, and you, you return that to me. That's what those vows mean. It's a complete self-donation of one person to the other including all one's powers, including the power of of procreation. And it's that promise that, and you say, yeah, that vow of marriage vow, that's my love. I'm expressing my love in the the most concrete way, in the the biggest way. I'm I'm promising my life to you for the rest of the, until death to us part. Okay. And again, don't you want to keep on repeating those marriage vows? Well, I did it once. Why do I have to do it again? I mean, isn't that last for life? I haven't changed. Well, you don't usually, although maybe on a big anniversary or something, you might re- re- repeat your vows, but you actually do it every time you come together as man and woman in, in, in bed in sexual intercourse. Your bodies are saying, I'm giving myself totally to you. I am reinforcing and expressing the marriage vows by the sexual act. That's what it's meant to be. And so this, this whole idea of the link between marriage, love, and sex Acting out our sexuality only within marriage, then, is not meant to be this repressive rule. I mean, that's completely misunderstand the point. The idea is, it's the only way you can, your body can speak honestly. Because otherwise, you're saying marriage vows before you're married. Um, 
And so your bodies are saying something that's not true. Because you're not really giving yourself completely to other because you haven't given yourself completely to one another. And so it's that whole idea of, do you, do you want it to be this honest, total act or not? Uh, this, this sexual act, which is, it's meant to be. So, now, I want to stop there just a second and say, of course, the problem with all this is that we are fallen human beings. Adam and Eve in, in the garden, remember, they were naked and without shame. This is fine for them. They, they had no problem with it because before the fall, there was no hang-ups or problems with this at all. Um, and they had com complete control of their passions. They still had passions, they, but they weren't fallen in disordered. Our sexual desires are all messed up. You know, they are. They're out of control. They're, they're, dis, they're misdirected because we're fallen. We, we have all these disordered, it's called concupiscence, if you want to use a technical term, but you don't need to remember that. But that's why, it's, so for us, it's, it seems repressive to, to limit this in some ways or to tell us, no, you can't go there or these sorts of things. And it's, it, I just wanted to, to stress that that's why it feels sometimes repressive to us because the fact is that we have these desires that this concept would rule out of bounds. And so it comes, there, comes, there comes to be friction here. Now, it's a basic Catholic moral principle that given the dignity of every person as made in the image and likeness of God, again, go back to, to first, uh, the first chapter of Genesis, we can't use ever another person as a means to an end, even if the, 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 the use is of mutual consent. Because this person is so dignified, we can't use, I can't use you simply for my own pleasure. When it's outside, I, I'm using you to say something with your body that's not true. Um, it, again, it's, it's breaking the, the, the actual purpose of God's gift of sexuality to use another person as an object of my desire. And again, sometimes that happens two ways. And we say, hey, well, I'll make a deal. You can use me and I use me. You use me and I use you. And it's all above board. Uh, we're all saying yes to this. And yet, it's not the self-gift of a person that leads to communion, uh, a self-gift of a person that leads to communion that leads to the new life in, in, in the total understanding of the, of the, of the picture. In fact, we call, we call uh, sexual intercourse the marriage act because it is the action that, that physically expresses the marriage vows. It is in and of itself a physical expression of that. And that's what sex is meant to be at the, the total deepest part of, of, uh, of meaning. And so when we talk about all the no's that we're going to, um, you know, why some sexual acts and relationships we would say are sinful, we're basically simply saying it's, they're no in the sense that they're not the big yes. They're going against the big yes. Um, and this is, you know, is there any other time, you know, you know those, those, those words, I do, you know, so that's one, you have a choice when you do a marriage uh, in a Catholic church. You can either repeat after the priest, I, Jack, take you, Jill, to be my lawful, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and bad, et cetera, et cetera. And I feed you the lines, or I can just say it. Jack, do you take Jill to be your wife? Do you promise to be true? And he simply ends up by saying, I do. Yes. I mean, this is like the, this huge yes in your life. I mean, think of how many times you've said, yes, yep, gotcha, I'm on board, yeah. I mean, you say that all the time. But I bet you remember your marriage as being this big yes. I was saying yes to this person. That's what sex is supposed to be, is the big Yes. So that's, that's the background context for the theology of human sexuality that the Catholic Church has. And so we're saying there's actually a meaning for sex. It's supposed to be the physical, again, I'm, I'm repeating myself just because I want to stress it. It's the, the physical expression of the marriage vows. That's what it is. That's what it means. It has a meaning. And it means the same thing everywhere. In China or in Alaska or in Nigeria, uh, it means the same thing in the second century. It'll mean the same thing in the 23rd century. That's what it means. That's what, that's what God gave us, this power of human sexuality. Now, so now let's go into um, some, of the other, some of the other facts about this or, or the teaching of the church. That being the case, 
since marriage can only take place due to the consent of both parties. And for those of you who are in the RCIA, you remember I said, you know, if there's not consent, if there's duress, if there's anything blocking the consent of the person, the full giving, the full self-gift of the other person, it's not a marriage. That's grounds for annulment. If you're blocking, if you're, if you're withdrawing, if you're holding some things, it's this whole, this, this whole idea of it's a gift that you're giving to the other person. It's not something that somebody can demand and take from you. It's not a right. Um, and I would say this, so I want to stress, sex is not a right. Children are not rights. Nobody has a right to have, to be a, to have a child. It's always a gift from God. Every child is a gift from God. You can't demand gifts. Sex is also a gift from God. You cannot demand, I, 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 I get to have sex because I want to have sex and it's my right to have sex. I say, well, you're talking a different language here. That's like, I have a right to be married to you. Well, not before I say yes, you don't. Yeah, I do, because I really want you. Well, too bad, I'm not saying yes. So again, that's the whole idea of gift. So all around the subject is the gift. This idea of nobody has the rights, and, but in our culture, that's really contrary to where we're at because for a 21st century Western culture, we are all about rights of the individual. I mean, that's a very strong, strong good for us. And if you tell me I don't have the right to something I want, that I don't think it's going to hurt somebody else, in, in bang up against their rights, then that's going to be a tough sell. That's, going to be, that's not going to work too well. They're going to say, you're trying to, you're trying to repress me, you're trying to hold, withhold my rights. Because for the, 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 our world does not see this as a gift. Uh, that's something that's given from God. I hope that this, this presentation so far has shown, for Catholic Church, there's a very positive value on sexuality. Now, it doesn't mean it's always been presented well or positively by priests, nuns, or parents, or something like that. Um, there's, a, there's a long history of sex as being dirty or bad or evil, or these sorts of things. Taking those, the fallen human nature that we have and the errors and sins that we sometimes fall into, and sometimes often, and saying, well, that's the real nature of sex, that's bad. No, that's, that's, that's called sin, and yeah, that's bad. But it's an, it's an abuse and a twisting of something that's very good. There are lots, lots of places in our, in our lives where we, we're taking something that's very good that we could, we could, we could mess up. Um, this, the power of human speech and these sorts of things, human strength. We can abuse these in all sorts of ways, but it doesn't make them wrong. So sex is good. I, I hope I don't have to say that, but I, but I do. Um, because it's a positive thing. Just as our bodies are good. There have been some philosophies and religions that say, well, um, the body's bad. We want, we want to escape the body. We want to go to the spirit. No, again, God made us. He made us body and soul. Uh, bodies are good things. Can we do bad things with our bodies? Sure. Can we do the bad things with our minds? You bet. But they're God-given. So it's, positive, it's, it's a positive good thing. That being said, given our fallen nature, we do struggle to try to control our sexual desires. Just as so we do, think about Let's, let's, let's use another, uh, another desire, a set of desires that we have. Is the sexual desire is very strong, but even stronger is the desire for food. Um, you can go a whole lot longer without sex than you can without food. It's a matter of life or death to have food. We want food. And yet, and it's good to eat. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the flavor. But, there's also that fact of the matter is that we can abuse, I mean, we in America abuse food quite a bit. We have lots of it. And so sometimes, you know, how many of us have ever been on a diet? You know, it's, we just have gone off the rails. And we don't think of that in terms, it's not as, seemingly as powerful as, as sex, but, but um, think of it in these terms. C.S. Lewis once said in one of his books, and I forget, forget which one, but he said, you know, these are two kind of disordered, well, pretty disordered desires food and, and, and sex, but sex is even more messed up. And because imagine if, you know, think about a strip club or something uh, where, where somebody comes out there and, start, and she starts to take off her clothes. 
and there's, there's this tension's building up and all this stuff starting to happen and the music's going and this da-da moment comes. But he, C.S. Lewis was saying, what if you were doing that and slowly lifting up all these, uh, these plates and stuff from a, a plate of ham? You know, it was a, the striptease of the ham. And then, whoa, oh, you know, ham. Um, we would say, you're, you've got a problem. You've got a big eating, it's dysfunctional, what you're doing. Um, but again, that, that whole idea of, of um, we, it's not completely under control. And so there is a sense of self-discipline that has to be taking place, but, but it's for food too. It's for drink. Catholics are not, you know, for Catholics, tasting alcohol is not a sin, getting drunk is. Um, discipline is necessary. Um, eating food is not bad at all, but there's such a thing as gluttony. Sex is a good thing, but there are all these other sins to it in which we misuse it. And so it's good, but it also has to be under control. So just some discipline has to take place here. Now, I want to talk about chastity. Boy, talk about an old word, huh? Doesn't that word just sort of chastity? I mean, that already just, that just sounds like the 1950s or something. Um, what is chastity? Chastity is also a beautiful virtue like courage, like patience, like love. Um, those, are, those are other virtues. This gets a bad rap because it seems, again, repressive. These are people who are chaste are, are the people who have no fun. They probably couldn't get a date anyway. And they, they want, they're just bad news. You know, no good or no, no cool person or no, you know, happy person is chaste. I, again, that's our society talking to us. But chastity is, first of all, I want to tell you what it's not. Chastity is not abstinence. Abstinence? How do you spell that? E-N-E-N-S-E? Is, e is there an I in there? Absten. I. T I E N Z. Yeah. Abstinence. It's kind of, you, you know how to spell it. Um, abstinence is simply not having sex. I'm abstaining. You remember we, said we abstain from meat? So again, remember the ham that's being involved in that. that um, here comes the ham. On Friday, we abstain from meat. We don't have it. Well, abstinence it means I'm abstaining from sexual acts. That's neither good nor bad. I mean, that's simply a physical fact. Some people do, some people don't. I mean, in, 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 again, it could be, you know, if, if you're married, it's true that you can't demand sex on this particular night, this particular place, but if, if one of the, the parties says, oh, I'm interested in repeating our vows, you know, I want to I repeat those vows physically with you, and the other person says, no, I just don't want to, and, and always says no, and it's, it's 20 years. I say, well, that doesn't sound like a very healthy marriage. Something's going on there. On the other hand, so that, you know, saying, saying yes, if you, uh, marriage is good, but absence might be a very good thing if you're not married. It would be. But, it, but it's in and of itself, without context, is, is simply a statement of fact. Celibacy, chastity is also not celibacy. Celibacy has a very particular meaning, and the, and the media always get this wrong. They, they say celibate when they mean abstinent, and none of them know what chastity is. <laughs> so celibacy is not marrying for the sake of the kingdom of God. That's what celibacy is. I have taken a promise of celibacy. I am not going to get married for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now, there are other people who say, I'm not going to get married for X, Y, or Z reason. That's not celibacy. Although it can sometimes be termed that just because it's kind of by, by analogy. But celibacy is, is simply a, a deliberate decision that has a religious basis saying, I am not going to get married for this very particular reason. It doesn't mean that everybody that, that doesn't get married is celibate. I'll go kind of loosely. Sometimes that it's, it's, said, it's used that way. But that's not really what it means. Now, if those are people simply decided to be single, Okay, and that's fine, but that's a decision. But celibate is, I'm, I'm doing that for a reason, and the reason somehow has to do with the kingdom of God. So what does chastity mean? What well, chastity is, neither abstinence nor celibacy is a virtue. And, and you can be celibate without being abstinent. I can take the promise of not marrying, I could have sex every night. It'd be sin, 
because I'm not married, but I'd still be celibate, I'm not married. So, again, these are all, these, these are all different things. Chastity is the virtue of living out your sexuality well according to your vocation in life. So if you're married, to be chaste might be having, I'm having sex two or three times a week. Great, no problem. It doesn't mean an absence of, of sexual acts at all. It means I'm living out my human sexuality virtuously in, according to my vocation, and marriage means I'm going to be ex exchanging you know, sexual intercourse with my spouse regularly, and I should. I'm, I'm, I'm reinforcing the, that love of my marriage through this nonverbal language of expressing that total gift that I gave in my vows. I should, again, and when I say that, you don't have to be thinking about that in time when you're engaging in sexual acts with your spouse. You're thinking, okay, this is like a vow. I'm going to say no, but that's what it is. But if you're single, chastity means I'm not going to be engage, engaging in sexual acts because my vocation as a single person or as a celibate is I'm not married. I, 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 haven't, I haven't exchanged vows with, it, with anyone. I have nothing to say, honestly, with my sexual body that way. That doesn't mean I'm abstinent because, well, I, if I'm single, I, I'm not abstinent, well, I'm not chaste. So chastity is, is it, has, it doesn't have anything to do with whether you have sex or not. It, ha, it has to do with whether you use your body in a sexual way according to your vocation and state of life. And so that's, it's a virtue, um, and it leads to happiness. That doesn't mean that people who are chaste aren't necessarily always without psychological issues. Everybody has them. Chaste people and unchaste people. And so it's not like everybody who's chaste um, is this walking signboard for mental health and the kingdom. Maybe you have seen people who are kind of messed up. But I've also seen lots of people who, this makes them very, you know, this is a sense of calm, peace, and happiness, and joy, because I'm living out my life according to the way God planned it to be lived out. I'm using my body the way he wants me to use it. So, it's not always easy. No virtue is easy in our, given our fallen nature. It's not always easy to be courageous. It's not always easy to be patient. It's not always easy to be humble. It's not always easy to be whatever. It's not always easy to be chaste. Because we have these disordered desires that want to take us to places that God doesn't want us to go. And that's why we have to have the discipline and the self-discipline to lead virtuous lives, and we need God's grace to do that. And when things go bad and we fall, that's why we have something called the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And so I, 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 would, I would stress that the truth is, you know, the sexual sins, the violation of the marriage vows, either because you've taken them and, and you're having sex with somebody else, or you haven't taken them and you're acting like you did. You know, these are serious sins, but they're not the most serious sins. Uh, you know, they, they can be mortal sins. They, in fact, they are. But there are worse sins. In the sense. So, so pride, hatred, these sorts of things are more spiritually destructive. They're coming from cold passion rather than from hot passion, so to speak. Uh, and so... I always say, okay, if we've fallen, this is why we have God's mercy, mercy in the sacrament of reconciliation. We come back and say, Lord, my, my fallen nature got the better of me. I'm sorry. I, I, I need to, uh, there's obviously some change that needs to go on here. I'll ask questions at the end, and the RCIA people will have plenty of time, will have some time to ask questions as well. But I want to just talk about the purpose of marriage, because this also deals with why some sexual acts are according to the plan, some aren't. And so for, for Catholics, sexual intercourse is the marriage act. When you get into some of these other sexual acts, um, of course, oral sex or masturbation or other things, that are not open to new life, then we're saying you're splitting up what marriage is supposed to be. Now marriage, as I, 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 I talked about last time, well, not last time, but when I talked about marriage, yeah. um, there's... There's the unitive, unitive, and the procreative dimensions to marriage. Dimension. Um, so, this marriage act, this marriage, it is supposed to both 
that's why I chose those two readings from, from, from Genesis. It's supposed to bind, like Adam and Eve, it, these, this couple into one body, in the one. And that's, it's supposed to be a union of persons. And that's not just physical. In sexual intercourse, it's also spiritual bind, bond. You know, you, you, you're supposed to come together. You're supposed to, not just, again, sexually, but emotionally, you know, intellectually. You know, all sorts of ways. You're supposed to go, go together and to be one. So that's unitive. And you can have unity of all sorts of ways. You know, that, that, and, but that's a good thing. If, if, you, if you are contemplating marriage and you don't imagine this other person is going to, there's going to be this bond formed, that you're going to be really good for each other, and you're, going to, you're going to supply the other person's weaknesses and things, there's going to be a complementarity there. Do you really want to marry that person? I'd have some questions. I mean, is that, are you really going to have, have this? That, remember what Adam said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This is why man leaves his, man, his father and his mother and he goes and he joins with this woman and they become one. And then God says, go out and multiply. Procreate. Fill the earth. And so there's this idea, there has to be communion, there also has to be new life. This idea, and it, it, yes, spiritual life, yes. Emotional life, yes. You become new in that way. But there has to at least be this openness to the biological life, because you're talking about the bodily expression, and there can be a bodily expression of new life as well. Now, given our fallen nature, that's not always going to happen. Because some of us, you know, we, we can't have children biologically, and some of us, that's due to age, and some because it's due to some sort of physical uh, defect of some kind or, or something. If you're talking about the whole population. But when you talk about this structure of this institution or this reality, its purpose is oriented towards both these. Um, and don't try to separate those two. The, the problem with, with trying to separate, if, you, if, you, if in the sexual act, or I, I would say, in, if, you, if you look at marriage as only really being unitive, and that whole procreation thing is optional, its real purpose is to bring two people together, well then, again, the problem is that the sexual act in marriage is not going to, there makes no sense to try to say that, well, this is procreation. Uh, the, the, the children has to be, it has to be open to life in some ways. And then, if that's not, if that's not in the idea, then of course all these other sexual acts um, that have nothing to do with the procreation of human beings become perfectly understandable. Uh, and you start to get sex outside of the procreation and it's much easier then, in fact, it becomes uh, mandatory because it's no longer the fulfilling of the vow, you can start to use the other person as an object. That's what happens. You can start to use the other person for pleasure. And again, it doesn't mean that you don't do it by mutual consent. You might. I'm not talking rape here. I'm just talking about the fact that the, the purpose is not also this new life. Um, that's, it's just not what you see as part of the importance of, of marriage. But also what you end up starting to see then is that sex itself starts to have less and less of importance because it's not bound to this marriage relationship you have. I can do this with anybody or anybody I feel a certain connection to. Plus then, and we talked about this a little bit last week, then the whole life dimension, you start to have procreation separated from not only marriage but from sexuality. We can now, we can now create human beings without sex taking place at all. So we're separating these two things. The unitive and the procreative in our society are drifting apart. Um, that those, those two dimensions. That's why you know, the idea of gay marriage only makes sense when all this is, has already started to happen. And for our culture, for the majority of people, that makes all the perfect sense in the world. Because their understanding of sex and marriage are completely different now. They've, they've drifted away from what the Catholic Church's understanding of marriage and sexuality are. Although, remember, up until 1930, every single Christian, at least officially in terms of theology and, and doctrine, had exactly the same teaching. But the others eventually slowly said, no, we, we're going to change for the times. We're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to believe that. Where the Catholic Church says, no, this is, this is the, the teaching that was once delivered to the saints and, and is, is still true. Human beings haven't changed. Uh, and marriage hasn't changed. So it's very, it, it can get very tricky because when we talk about uh, I, uh, in vitro fertilization, or we talk about what's the big deal with masturbation or pornography or things, it's really hard to come up with really, really good answers um, unless you believe this theology. 
And sometimes we want to pick and choose. And I say, I want the IVF thing, but I still want to say pornography is not so good. On what basis? What are, we, what are we talking about here? What's the meaning of this for you? What's your, if, you're not, if you don't believe in God, what's your philosophy? So this is the Catholic churches. And so we're out of step with the culture. There's no doubt about it. Um, and we're out of step with all of our, some of our desires. I mean, there's nobody here who's not fallen and doesn't have uh, sexual thoughts, actions, and words in, in his or her past that you would be ashamed to have anybody else see. I always say that. There's nobody here who has such a wonderful life in the sexual dimension of their life and their past that they would be able to just sort of let everybody see it and not feel shame. We've all, you know, shame is all over this because it's that fallen, it's, such, it's something so important that it has been messed up so badly that the shame itself is an indication of how important it is. That when we get it wrong, we know it's important and, and we get torn in these directions. I would say this too, though. You know, I think the sexual revolution, um, which is, the sexual re revolution really started with the effectiveness of, of the, the birth control pill. Um, that, that's what really set the whole thing off. Um, its purpose was to make sex, sex good, happy, available, free. Free. And first off, I, I would first say it's perfectly possible to identify in the past areas, including Catholic and other Christian uh, cultures and societies, where we got sexuality wrong. And it wasn't a, it, it wasn't a healthy situation. And there were things that certainly needed to be changed. But I, I would also say, you know, I can't prove this. I don't have, I haven't done a psychological or a sociological study of this. I have no data uh, in a sort of organized form to back it up. But and some of you think, well, you don't know anything about marriage either. All I can say is I've done a lot of counseling. I've done lots of confessions. I've had tens of thousands of confessions, most of whom are married, and most of whom have confessed sins against their spouse. So I know all about the, I, I think I know lots about the inner working of, 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 of marriages. And I, it's my, my, here's some things I, I think have been happening the last 17 years since I've been a priest. First of all, pornography is just blown out of the world. From the 1997, when the internet was just starting to start to really perk up, till now, it's just, poof, it's exploded. It's out of control now. It's 40, 50% of American males are addicted to pornography. And it's mostly, you were talking internet stuff, because it's in their phone, and they can't get away from it, they live with it, um, how are you going to get away from this stuff? And talking about objectifying and, and messing up with this stuff, that's there. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I think, another thing I've seen is, I think there's less sex now than there used to be. I really do think that in marriages. I think people aren't that much, I think these are two related, kind of. I think there's all this sort of, you're going off in these directions where it's really hard for this person to compete with Hollywood, and the pornography industry. And this is so much easier, and it's so much, you know, it's just uncomplicated. Um, I just think there's a sexual crisis, but it's not what people think it is, it's just that it's, it's, there's less happiness in sexuality. I think, I think there's less excitement in sexuality now than there probably was. I, I wasn't a priest back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or whatever, but I, I just have this creeping feeling that sex is kind of withering on the vine in lots of our marriages. Not that it's all, by the way, Nobody has a great sex life in this parish. Now, you might think, oh, yeah, I do. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you're the one that's 5%. But everybody's messed up. And they always have been. And, you know, that's just a fall in nature. So don't think, you know, I'm the only one who has this messed up sexual life. That it's just completely kind of weird. Oh, are you kidding? Because, um, again, you think I don't know anything about it? People see way more than I need to know all the time um, about their sexual lives. And so I, I think I know more about you than... than Probably you do, um, in terms of your sexual life. And there's lots of there's problems out there, but I think it's getting kind of worse. I don't think sex has gotten better in the last 50 years. I really don't. And I'm not even sure there's more of it now. I'm really not sure. And I think, that, I think there's a, a vocations crisis in, in marriage that is linked up with this. Um, I think the sex is better when you follow this. It doesn't mean it's easy. Because to live out a chaste marriage, according to Catholic theology, is really challenging. Especially when you have all these things bombarding you 
saying, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, go there, don't go down this direction. And your fallen human nature wants to go down there. But I really do think, you not only are you healthier, I think you actually, it's, sexuality is better when there's a certain amount of modesty, when there is self-discipline involved, when there's a meaning to it, and you know how it's connected to love, and you know how those two are connected to your marriage. It doesn't mean your sexual acts are always perfectly fulfilling and they always take place according to how Hollywood wanted it to, but it's still a better, healthier context for marriage and for sexuality within marriage. Um, and so I haven't, it, 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 I, I said this in my, my homily, the, 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 the context of this is for the Catholic Church, the way to have sex that's not going to be outside, it's not going to be sinful, is between a man and a woman who are married, who are um, celebrating sexual intercourse with one another, that the act is open to, at least not deliberately shutting off life. And so all those other sexual acts, you say, no, those are, those have become disordered, disordered spinoffs of what it was meant to be. I've really kind of deliberately left not much question, time for question for the, the larger world. Um, but we're going to go down to the RCIA uh, room down in the Holy Family Room. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a presentation from a woman who's a, an expert in natural family planning for about a 15-minute uh, little talk about what it is and how you can get more information if you want it. And then um, any questions that you have. And then, you know, we're going to do a little eating and stuff. And there might be some business to take care of. But I do want to say, just for those who walked in late or something, this is the last of our talks for the year. Um, there is one more talk for the RCIA about the uh, social teaching of the church. But next week, this church is going to be used by our choir to practice for Easter in the Holy Week. So the church is going to be in use. And there's not really enough room down in the Holy Family Room to have everybody. So not that you're not wanted, but um, so I'd like to thank you for sticking it out and uh, coming to our courses. And for, for the RCA, don't forget to come down there next time at 7 o'clock. So let's finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of human sexuality and, and the, the great gift you have given us to, to share in your life, the life of the Trinity, the way in which we share in the self-gift of persons that is a communion that is bringing forth life. You yourself are the source of all that. You are love. May we join in that love through our thoughts, words, through our faith, and through our bodies. And we ask all these things through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.